All right, roll call. Uh, Robert Hannon. I'm here. Rich uh, Berlandi. Here. Dave Fox. Here. Robert Eisner. Here. Neil uh, Kelsey. Here. Mark uh, Simpson. Here. Ned uh, Stanchin. Robert Canto. And Emily Brick. All right. Agenda. Okay, so we'll call the April 6, 2022 Wetlands Commission meeting uh, to order. Um, first item on the agenda, New Business Carrier Group, Inc. Uh, for a project over on Morea Road. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, for the record, my name is Tom Daly. I'm a professional engineer with the firm of um, SLR Consulting. Um, and we're excited to be before this commission this evening to uh, present this new application. Also with me this evening is Johnny Carrier representing uh, the applicant, and also James McManus is our uh, wetland scientist. So well, ultimately, I think uh, the order will be myself, um, and then James will, will present, and then Johnny will um, close up, and then we'll have a chance to chat with the commission. But uh, so the, the application before you this evening is, as the chair said, is on uh, Morea Road, um, which is, um, and, and the proposal is for a cluster subdivision. So in the zoning regulations, there's, um, they're really kind of grouped together. There's an open space and cluster subdivision regulation, which allows you to have smaller lots than um, what's underlying the zone, but then you have to provide open space. So, um, and then we'll walk you through it and, and I think it'll become pretty clear as to, to why this approach was taken. So, uh, Bruce, next slide. So the, uh, the, the uh, subject uh, property is actually two parcels. And um, you can see on, this is a copy of the town GIS mapping, uh, the Northern um, kind of very square parcel uh, that is known as uh, 8517, um, uh, and that's approximately about just a little under 43 acres. And then the kind of long, thin parcel running in a um, uh, east to west location, that's really what we're going to talk about mostly this e evening. Uh, that's 8518, and that's about 40, just a slightly over 44 acres. So the two combined parcels, uh, you're looking at about 80, just under uh, 86 acres. And you can take a look at this parcel. So um, uh, as you can see, just on the left-hand side of this map is the uh, city of Bristol and the town of Burlington. Um, to, the, uh, to the right is Snowberry Cobble. Um, directly to our north is dedicated open space. And then um, we have about additional single family uh, subdivisions to our south. Uh, next slide. Uh, well, you know, uh, James will speak to, uh, you know, more accurate mapping. But the reason we are before you this evening is there is a wetland resource on, um, on the subject parcels. This is just the town GIS um, on this. This is obviously, a, a, you know, a part of the Scott Swamp uh, watershed. Um, next slide. We also have floodplain on the parcel. So as part of Scott Swamp uh, watershed, there is a, uh, a mapped FEMA floodplain that goes to the central portion of the site. Um, just to, I, I won't talk about it again this evening, but uh, we have no activities within uh, the flood zone. Next slide. Oops. Sorry, there are a bunch of different sizes. So this is somewhat of an overview of uh, the application and we'll get a little more detail. So, as I said, it's just shy of 86 acres. The green represented here is, is uh, proposed to be dedicated as open space. So uh, as part of this um, application, we are looking to dedicate um, almost 65 acres of open space um, to, uh, or to whatever uh, entity is appropriate. But that's about 75% of the overall site. Um, what you see in blue are the two clusters of subdivisions. Um, while it's one application, they really do function almost uh, independently. Um, they're really uh, uh, don't, you know, they don't interact uh, at all. They stand on their own. And 
and just to give you so um and then we have some area that's more of a celery or an olive green those are areas of stormwater management that we would expect to uh, have a conservation easement over it but at the point we still want to uh, retain rights to maintain those stormwater basins but to give you a sense so we have 18 uh, on the left hand side or 18 huh, single family homes and on the right hand side uh, you have seven single family homes for a total of 25. Next slide. And, and we'll just scroll. The, this is because it was such a long piece that it was falling on two different sheets. Uh, we put together basically a side by side comparison. So at the top part of this map is the existing conditions uh, showing the topography. That central area right down the middle is where the, the, uh, the floodplain is located. And um, we really, you have to topography on both sides that are sloping up away from the wetlands. And that's why you're seeing the clusters of those lots on those two sides. Next slide. So I, I tend to refer to these as the left and the right side, but let's go through the right side. Um, this is an area, as I said, is seven uh, single family homes. We have a small cul-de-sac roadway that, um, you're moving the weapons on me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, we have a small cul-de-sac subdivision, a small cul-de-sac road, um, and we have, um, as I said, se seven single family homes. Located to the left, you'll see, is um, a stormwater basin. So each of the two sides of the site have their own stormwater management system. And uh, each one includes the following. One, uh, all of them will have um, a, um, a, a water quality chamber prior to the discharge. Uh, to meet that standard. And then we go into, we have a sediment four bay, which is the first part of the basin, goes into a larger portion of the basin, and then with an overflow. On this particular basin, we actually designed a level spreader uh, at the outflow to let water kind of get more of a linear pattern going back into the wetlands. Um, the basins are designed for quantity and quality. So they've been sized for the two through the hundred year storm, peak storm events. Uh, where we're showing no net increase for both of those storm events. In addition to that, they're also designed for water quality. So they have stormwater retention um, associated with um, uh, the first flush. The basins also will be seeded. Uh, really, we have a couple different things going. So all the area around the basin that is, is not to be lawn is going to be seeded with a conservation mix. The bottom of the basins, we're actually in this situation, we're going to actually, we're proposing a plug so small little plugs, but we're gonna cover the bottom of the basin with those plugs. And there's a plant list on our, um, on our site. And we think that might be an opportunity to really jumpstart the bottom of these basins as opposed to the traditional seed mix. And then around the, on the banks of these basins, we kind of took um, something from the playbook of a recent application we became, we were before you. Uh, we have more of a perennial slash pollinator um, plant, uh, perennial, these are more gallon containers around the perimeter. And those gallon containers, uh, those plants include milkweed, um, goldenrod, iron, ironweed, those type of species to, um, to uh, enhance uh, that, uh, I guess, the, uh, the wildlife opportunities down in those basins. Uh, the projects, uh, both sites are served by both uh, public sanitary sewer and public water. Um, so there's not septic uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, or septic and wells on the site. Um, as we approach the design of this, um, this project, one of the goals we were trying to do was maintain a minimum of a 25 foot um, buffer to the existing wetlands. And we've done that on every lot but two. So on, on this particular side of the project, uh, the driveway going to lot five right there as a slight encroachment into the 25 foot, but in the er other areas, we've uh, maintained that throughout. And we're also calling on our plans that there'll be markers placed all along the 25 foot uh, or, or that 25 foot buffer um, a, a, on, on the lots, but then uh, the other area is just gonna be dedicated open space. Next slide, Bruce. So on this side, we move to the, the left hand of the, uh, of the parcel. Uh, th on this side, we have 18 lots. And really, we come off of uh, the road and we, uh, we go to two, two cul-de-sacs. Uh, one, we have the main cul-de-sac on, on the right. 
and the left we have more of a smaller cul-de-sac because it's only uh, um, uh, accommodating a few houses. Um, at the far upper right is our stormwater basin that includes the same elements that we presented um, to you before. The basin is fully outside the uh, 25 foot upland review area. Um, but once again, the basin is designed for both quantity and quality. Similar plant species, plugs at the bottom of the basin, at the basin, the lowest tier, and then uh, a perennial or a um, wildflower type uh, uh, gallon containers to be around the perimeter. And then any area that's disturbed outside that basin area will be hit with a, um, a conservation seed mix. Um, once again, so we have on this particular side, we have maintained the 25 foot uh, upland review buffer throughout, except for one lot, which Bruce, if you go, if you go, it would be yeah, uh, just to the right of that, oh, yeah. right there. That particular lot, we have a little portion of the grading of the backyard that's uh, within the, um, the 25 foot. Um, we're also, so as I said, we're, we're, we have a total area of about 80, 80, um, 86 acres, and we're looking to propose everything north of this would be um, dedicated as open space, which is part of the, the uh, um, Scotts Farm. Once again, as I said, we, we don't have any uh, direct wetlands impact. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it, I think, next slide, Bruce, let me just check. If I, yes, so next slide, um, Jim McManus will present the wetlands. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, Jim McManus, uh, Certified Professional Soil Scientist with JMM Wetland Consulting Services with offices uh, at a new town. <clears throat> uh, I spent uh, a number of days on site uh, in 21. I was out there in May, August, and September. Most of them, and those, those visits were there to do wetland delineation, gather baseline and data for this report and also I did some spot checking uh, of the wetland boundaries uh, that were previously done. Uh, after talking with the team, we decided to redelineate the eastern side. So the, when you saw the wetland boundary on the east property or the right hand side of the cluster, uh, th those were my boundary. That line indicates mine. There was discrepancy. There was a lot of mist flagging. So we, we decided to I'd just redo it. The western side or the left-hand side, uh, I did a spot check back in May of 21, and uh, there was more flagging to be found, and I was in agreement what was done previously. So that boundary shown is the boundary from the other fella. I believe it was a male. Uh, I'm not sure who did it. I think it was David Lord, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But I didn't do a, a formal delineation on the left-hand side or the western boundary, but uh, I was in agreement with what I was seeing on the map and also what I was indicating or seeing in the field. I did a, I did a, a final visit in, in March 24th of this year, and that whole visit was to review the, both sides for uh, potential vernal pools or at least vernal pool habitat. And one was found, and we'll go through that a little bit later. Um, so... Each wetland, well, the main wetland on site is what Tom discussed before, which is Scott Swamp Brook, which is a large continuous wetland that extends off site to the north. And that's our best. And it, it, looking at the aerials, it looks like it's greater than 100 acres. So it's a sizable place. Now we have bordering wooded swamps on each side, one on the west side or the left hand side, and one on the right side. I mean, uh, yeah, on the right side, east side. Uh, both wooded swamps, uh, full canopies. Uh, so that's about that. So, uh, and they're all sort of part of the unit of, uh, uh, of, of Scott Swamp Brook. I'll go a little bit to that vernal pool. One area was located in the southeast section of the western cluster or the left-hand side cluster. So down by the, by the road. Bruce, Star. I think if you scroll forward, we have Jim, Jim's. Uh, I think I have, yeah, that's, next that's, one. No, just next the, one. that's the inventory map just showing. There you go. There, there you is. go. Jim. So there's roughly where it is. You see the road, you see where the, the vernal, pool, uh, vernal pool is, that little shaded area. And then there's, we call the 100 foot envelope, uh, which is, uh, we kind of want to leave that undisturbed, if you will. And, and uh, we Bruce, found a cluster of 16 wood frog egg masses and about nine inches of water. The rest of that 
wooded swamp had two to four inches, which is not sufficient depth. So that was the only area that was was breeding at the time. And uh, of no no other vernal pools were observed on either side, the remaining part of the west and also on the east. Uh, I can talk about it now a little bit, but it just so happens that the 100 foot envelope actually uh, is greater than 100 feet before you hit any development. But we can talk about that Oops. shortly. There we go, Bruce. There we okay. Go. There. So as you can see, we're not, the wooded area is still intact. And this whole corridor, which will be, which is still intact as well. Uh, so these wood frogs at least have their habitat intact so they can move about without a lot of disturbances. Uh, we, we did do a function value asses assessment on both sides, including Swamp, Swamp, uh, Scott Swamp Brook. If you look at my, my report on page seven, um, there's a table one. Uh, I don't know if you have that, but it doesn't really matter if you don't. Uh, oh, you do have it. There's some pictures. Uh, that was the picture of the vernal pool area. Uh, there's the bottom, the next picture below you is just another, uh, what a wooded swamp looks like on the Western side. So anyways, uh, Scott Swamp Brook has about seven principal functions. No surprise, there, there's, there's a picture of Scott Swamp Brook. Uh, there's a picture of the vernal pool area, but the shallower portions where you can see some of the sedges are popping up already. Um, the, the other two, the Eastern wetland and the Western wetland are, uh, have less, much less principal functions, mainly due to the, uh, the agricultural uses in the past, uh, miscellaneous soil disturbances. You know, there was a, on the East side, there was a ditch dug, who knows when, uh, there was miscellaneous soil piles in various locations, particularly on the East side. The East side was much more disturbed than the Western, uh, the Western side. Uh, had a low diversity of plants in the two wooded swamps next to the development. Uh, invasive species were observed. Nevertheless, though, these wetlands do connect to the Scott Swamp Bronx, so in overall, the function and value of the whole unit is higher than probably it would be if, if Scott's, Scott's, Scott's Swamp Brook wasn't there. As Tom said, we do not, we are not proposing any direct impacts to wetlands. However, we do look at uh, indirect impacts, uh, both short-term construction and long-term, which water quality and habitat impacts. And we look at a number of items. One is erosion and sediment control. That typically comes into play, obviously, during construction. We're not anticipating any impact due to that, due to our robust ENS plan. The soils themselves are mildly erosive and the slopes are not horrible. They're pretty mild in, 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 uh, as development goes. Uh, and also with diligent monitoring, we're certainly not impact, uh, 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 expecting any impacts due to erosion sediment control during the construction phase. Other things we look at is removal of native vegetation or habitat loss. Uh, we are going to be moving, uh, removing tree cover from, e from both sides, the east and the west. However, an effort has been made to limit the clearing and uh, I was recommending that uh, the limits of clearing be kind of monumented or labeled or, or signs put up. So which indicates the limits and no vegetation should be, uh, you know, removed beyond these limits. And uh, so that will, you know, hopefully in ensure that uh, the landowners will abide by that and keep these uh, necessary wooded buffers, particularly on the lots that are not all lots, but there's a few lots that are within the wetland you know, the, 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 the property boundaries do fall within wetland areas or close to. Uh, another thing we look at is uh, wetland hydrology and stream flow. Uh, we, we're not impacting any of that. The wetlands are, uh, the on-site wetlands are, are, are uh, have shallow groundwater and surface flows. We're not interrupting that with the exception of the roadway which we are capturing, putting it through a, a formal drainage system and then discharging it to the wetlands. Uh, and then the final thing we looked at is uh, potential water quality impacts. And again, 
We have a uh, best management practice stormwater management system, including catch basins, hydronomic, hydrodynamic separators, stormwater basins. And uh, so all that put together, we're going to certify or qualify or and, and the engineers can get into the details of the water quality volume, but we're, we're, we're not anticipating any impacts from, from the development to the water quality of the wetlands on and off site. So in quick conclusion, you know, with diligent monitoring, obviously during the construction phase, uh, we're not anticipating any uh, uh, short or long term uh, impacts upon these wetlands and on and off site, and they should function as they are today. Thank you, Jim. Um, so I think next is we have Johnny. So next slide, hey. Bruce. Thanks, Jim. Uh, uh, go up to the uh, keep going, Bruce. Whoa, whoa, what? That's not good. You guys seen us? So it's not on my end only. <laughs> I see a black screen. No, that was me. Well. All right. Well, wait, while you get the slide going, I'll I'll just. Uh, introduce myself a little bit um, and then we can get to the 17th slide if you don't mind when when it uh, agrees with you. Um, so my name is Johnny Carrier. I am a uh, second generation builder uh, office address in uh, 68 South Canal in Plainville. Um, I'm a second generation builder as I said. My family's been building for a little over 50 years. Um, we are local to Connecticut. Uh, we're local to Farmington. Um, currently in town, we're working on one project that's at Yorkshire over by the hospital off of Middle Road. Uh, but our, some of the past uh, projects we've done from my, our, my immediate side of stuff that I've handled is Langman's Quarters, uh, others by other family members like Autumn Estates in this, this vicinity, uh, Chimney Hill and a couple others if you go back. Um, so my, myself and, and my immediate family, we've really push this open space or conservation type subdivision um, for the last 25 years or so, maybe even a little bit more. So our first one actually was in Wallingford. We, we hired a, a landscape architect professor from UConn. His name was Peter Minuti, uh, who had done some, some time in Europe looking at how to develop the land the right way and having smaller, more manageable lots and leaving some open space, et cetera. Um, and since that 1995 project, we've done more in Unionville with Langdon's Quarters, also in Cheshire, Meriden, and Newington, and right now we're, we're currently doing one in Cromwell. Most of these subdivisions have an excess of 25%, uh, sometimes even excess of 50% open space. Again, uh, getting the densities that would be with traditional zoning, but concentrating it uh, and, and, and leaving some areas for wildlife corridors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on this particular, par particular parcel, as Bruce has up on the screen, um, Tom laid out, there's actually two parcels that we are looking at um, with this property. And that north one, 8517, uh, that parcel there, and then the parcel to the south where the development is, uh, 8518. So as Tom mentioned, the development is strictly on 8518. Um, and, but originally we did look at development on both areas. Uh, when we looked at traditional layouts, they were in that you know 23 to 27, depending on how the layouts were. So we're not uh, you know, looking for extra density at this point. We actually just looked at this from A, a conservation standpoint and B, um, looking at it as a better development for the town in general. Um, so some of the reasons why on, on this slide, uh, actually, Bruce, if you could go to slide 18, that might be easier to see. So as you come down Maria Road, uh, you have frontage for both of these um, uh, uh, parcels or roadways from Farmington. The parcel of land 8517 to the north has a buildable area but it's accessible only by driving into Bristol around the neighborhoods and then through that way. Um, this, when meeting with the town and staff, uh, we looked at issues with road access to Bristol, not just from access, but from a DVW snow plowing standpoint, from uh, looking at trash pickup, buses, school systems, 
uh, et cetera, and then throw in the mix uh, intermunicipal water agreements or sewer agreements. So this looked to be a lot simpler uh, to try to go for the R40 cluster. Uh, again, uh, not utilizing that area to the north and using the cluster to kind of keep the density in the same uh, in the same neighborhood. Um, some of the uh, there's a large chunk of land off of that Bristol cul-de-sac to the north uh, that would support I think it was 10 or 12 lots in that area alone. That being said, um, the you know we we talk about the agreements and some of this, but Part of the conservation subdivision discussion that we have both from commissioners and, and from developers is leaving open space, not just open space to protect some of the uh, some more sensitive areas, but also open space that the town can utilize or have access to, or in essence has benefit to the town. Um, this parcel to the north, our plan, since it's not being touched, is to donate in its entirety fee simple to the town. And that's been discussed with, with staff. Um, with the exception of how legal would look at it, this could be done as soon as uh, approvals are done or when developments and, and, and uh, uh, site plans are filed, et cetera, because there is a little bit of lag time between them. Uh, but because it's not part of the original development, as long as it meets all legal requirements, can be done. Um, right now, to the Scott Swamp Brook area, there exists only one access that the town has, uh, and that is a pedestrian access that was done with the Autumn Estates uh, subdivision, which is just north of that Snowberry Cobble. Um, I know this because I had done the approvals back in, I think it was 05 or 06, and we had left an area for you know, either town staff or, or the town to access the Scott Swamp area, uh, but it goes along the side of, of uh, that parcel and then the neighbor to the north. This development and the way that we're proposing it and leaving that northern section and, and deeding it to the town along with additional open space, and I'll get into the numbers in a minute, uh, would actually provide road access through that Bristol cul-de-sac. And the landing area in Farmington is actually a non-wetland area, uh, which gives uh, more access to the town, et cetera. Uh, we're, we're not proposing any uses at this point. That would be for the town to take out, whether that would be pedestrian or or just open space. We're just saying that part of this development, we're, we're looking to donate that area. Um, the total parcel between, the total acreage between the two parcels is, is just shy of 86 acres, it's 85.6. The development acres is actually 17.7 between the two clusters, which is about 21% of the overall land area. Um, there is a small 4% um, or 3.2 acre piece or, or portion that will remain with the owner, which is Bruce right to the, uh, the eastern uh, farm headstead right there, right there. There's a, a portion of this land that would stay with that farmhouse and, uh, and the parcel that's there. That equals about 4% or 3.2 acres. And then the overall of the uh, parcel would basically benefit in 75% over space or 64.8 acres um, uh, in total. So that's between the northern parcel and the additional areas uh, after the development is done. Just to give in comparison, that Scott Swamp area uh, from the GIS that I checked a few days ago, uh, the town currently owns five parcels to the north, um, equaling about 78 acres. This would be adding uh, almost another 65 acres contiguous to that open space. Um, and, and, and as a, a resident of Farmington and someone who's, who's been here for a while, I've seen the, uh, uh, and heard all of the, you know, the qualities of spots, the Scott Swamp area and the need to protect it, et cetera. And we felt that the conservation type or cluster in this zoning reg um, would be the best use of this property uh, where both, you know, uh, myself, the owner, and the the town walk away with is something that they can, you know, hang their hat on and be proud of. Um, the other thing I wanted to just touch upon was proximity to the wetlands. Uh, you know, we're we're proposing that 25 foot uh, non disturbance, with the exception of those two small areas of the driveway. Um, 
my my company and myself, which I say my company, but I've got a lot of family members who are directly involved and are doing a lot of the work in the field. Uh, we're currently involved in a project in Farmington that is uh, a lot closer than that. So we're very used to working in those tight conditions and doing it the right way. Uh, Yorkshire right now has not a 25 foot non-disturbance, it has a 25 foot building setback. Um, and we have disturbance in a few spots right up to the wetlands. Um, and if, you, if I would say that over the last four years or so, uh, we do not have the benefit of flat area and good soils. Uh, we have terrible soils. Uh, and, and we have a lot of grade and we've worked hand in hand with staff to make sure uh, that the sediment erosion control measures are in place. We've had to make some decisions with staff on the fly, working in, in time frames that are uh, better suited for, uh, for that property. So we do have the history of working in these type of environments, et cetera. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say before I, I give it back to Tom is, you know, the, both Jim and Tom had mentioned placards at the, uh, at the non-disturbance areas along the wetlands. Uh, we have done this uh, both with and without um, conditions from approval. Uh, it seems like that is the absolute best measure for homeowners in the future to really understand that they're not supposed to be going over a certain line, et cetera. So we do have a lot of experience with that. Uh, we usually put placards and stuff that last for 40 to 50 years. Uh, et cetera. So that, um, along with oversight from town staff, would ensure that that, that, that non-disturbance is not impeded in the future. Um, with that, I will give it back to Tom, and, um, and Tom could either give final stuff or we could take any questions at this time. No, thank you, Johnny. I think uh, myself, Jim, and Johnny have uh, given the full presentation, so uh, we're all available to ask, uh, either provide additional information or answer any questions the commission may have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rick, I'll start with you. If, or Rich, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, no concerns. Um, just, uh, I was, I was just wondering if the, if you had looked at the national, national diversity database with the state, uh, if there was anything located in this area. Jim, how about? Um, I did not take a look at that right this minute, but uh, we can. That was my only comment question. All right, thanks, Rich. Dave? Yeah, I think on that NDDB thing, uh, agenda. Uh, memo it says that it is within a, a database area so the deep should be content. You should follow through on that. Um, I was wondering uh, on the vernal pool, um, you went that um, at one time uh, two weeks ago, I guess, um, and no, but no salamanders were found. Is, was that a, a prime time to see salamanders or might, yeah. a, follow -up, might, might a follow up visit? We could do a follow-up visit, but uh, this has been an odd spring, uh, so things are well moved. And uh, for instance, I was at a, a vernal pool today in uh, the town of Woodbridge, and some of the wood frogs are actually hatching. So, and there was plenty of sal salamanders there. Uh, we counted, you know, lots of lots going on. So, again, it's a smaller pool. Uh, kind of in its location near the road, sort of, uh, you know, but we could take another look, but uh, I'd be surprised at this point if salamanders are gonna make it in there that they, have, they haven't made it yet because uh, the weather has been conducive for uh, more than one movement yeah, since just, March. I was just a little concerned because your uh, report says that no salamanders were found, so. Well, they weren't there that day. It was but, just 16 cluster. Yeah, it was 16 wood frag. Any means it's not as good a whirlpool as one that did consent salamanders. So I don't know if it's good. not as good. It's not as good. They just needed a little bit larger critical habitat zone than the wood frogs do. 
that's all the difference. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the hundred foot envelope is still important. Uh, the corridor is left open. That's important. So I don't know if it's any worse, but yeah, salamanders are a little bit more quote sensitive to things than the wood frogs are pretty, pretty robust. Uh, they can handle, you know, less the water quality can be a little less and still be able to do it. They get in and out quicker, things like that. Yeah, so we certainly thinking. we could take another glance at it prior to uh, you know the end of the season here. Okay, I appreciate that. Just to, to make sure that. You know, so. Yeah. Yes, that that's about it for now. Oh, I was I was looking at the at the plans. It looks like eight of the houses are within our regulated area. Probably be good to document, you know, the number of houses in our regulated area. A little hard to make you out, Dave. Your end. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, maybe right, you can. I'll, I'll have to get closer to my mic. Down 150 better? foot. Yeah, you can. You can actually um, see it on the map here. I don't have a number offhand, but um, I can take this graphic and and highlight that 150 foot. Yeah. Um, for you, it's there. You can see, yeah. I've got a mark I, I on my set here, but it's uh, where I was think, it? I think I had counted eight houses. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, yeah, I think that's probably a, a fair. That's probably a fair number. Yes. Yeah, here's 150. So there's one, two, three, four right there. And it kicks over, and I think it was four on each side. Right yeah, and yeah, it comes it, across it, here. It, yeah, it may be more than that. I, I can get yeah. I can get you um, I can get you that number. Yeah, I know you did say uh, eight and a half acres. Yeah, yeah, that's in the. Uh, I think that's in my report. I think I gave the. Uh, right. Yeah, it's uh, eight point five three acres of clearing and work within the uh, one hundred fifty foot upland review. Yeah, on and one one note on the one page application, the eight point five figure is put on linear feet instead of acres. Bottom of the page. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Just, just a typo. I didn't notice. I think that's it for now. Thank you. All right, there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, thanks, Dave. Robert. Yeah. Um, Johnny, I, I appreciate the explanation on some of the issues with the proximity of access through Bristol only for the upper parcel, uh, because before you had that component added in, the development really didn't make any sense. It looked like the, the additional acreage was being added just for the purpose um, of the cluster development. And it would beg the you know, reason why not just go with a more traditional development, but with all of those public service issues, having the access through um, Bristol to come into a Farmington parcel. It makes a lot of sense to use a cluster development on, this, on these parcels. The layout um, that we're seeing does propose a lot more construction in much closer proximity to the wetlands. And as um, Commissioner Fox just raised, the number of houses within the 150 foot setback. Um, is, is much greater than we normally see. So I think a closer review of the overall proposal um, is likely going to be needed. So I think we're gonna get around to accepting, certainly we're gonna wanna do a, you know, a site walk on this and uh, likely there is the potential for significant impacts from the development. So I would be looking down the line for a hearing on this particular project. The vernal pool, um, is also another issue that um, we'll want to pay a lot of attention to. Um, so looking at the way the lots are currently laid out, um, the two lots that are closest to the vernal pool, and then um, the lots, yeah, those two lots, the odd configuration of lots, to me, it would seem inevitable whoever purchased those lots will utilize a straight line backyard. We've seen time and time again um, that once the developments are in, um, individual 
property owners, even with good conservation markers, tend to encroach. Uh, they tend to push the limits. So I think having, you know, an, an uneven line or an arc line may not be feasible. So looking to see what we can do to, to better protect um, and maximize the separation between the residential use and the vernal pool is going to be important um, down the line. So I, I also encourage getting that additional look um, at the vernal pool um, because we're going to want that information as this application moves forward. So now would be a really, really good time to do that additional uh, you know, look at the vernal pool. Um, I, I think that probably concludes, you know, my comments for now. Uh, you know, I will look to accept it and move through the process and go from here. End of my comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Robert. Neil, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, I appreciate the, the thoroughness of the presentation this evening, and I don't have any uh, comments or questions at this time. Okay, thank you. Mark? I think I would uh, pretty much repeat what Robert just stated. Uh, I think obviously a site visit, normally we do that anyways, but this one in particular that we need to look further into this. But also my concern are those two lots um, near the vertical pool. And my concern is, just like Robert said, is once somebody gets in there, they're going to start saying, well, I want a bigger backyard and, uh, and the trees start disappearing. And it's important to keep the tree canopy there for the vertical pool to keep, uh, keep it as natural as possible. Um, 100 feet, that's, that's probably the minimal distance you need before you get close to development. Um, in some sense, it's preferred to be even more than that, but 100 feet is the, the minimal amount. And so we got to try to find some way to prevent people from chopping down those trees any further than what is proposed by the developer. So that's it, thank you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Ned, you snuck in since we did the initial uh, Yes. Checking in of commission members. So do you have any questions? Yeah, I, I, I did. I was here. Um, I think it was Tom was still introducing the project. So I was, was here for the whole thing. Yeah, I have a few questions. Um, so on this sheet here, I see there's a 20 foot sanitary easement. It, is that uh, existing sewer lines in there or is that new sewer lines to accommodate this development? It's a new sewer line with an easement uh, to be granted to the town. Okay. And so the sewer lines aren't necessarily like following the road. They're, they're coming up in different directions. They're like... Yeah. Um, the way it's sloped from a topographic standpoint, uh, if, you, if you look at this map, the, the cul-de-sac is, is going downhill all the way to where Bruce just put his cursor. Okay. So what we have to do is the sewer runs down there and I can't run back up. So right. what we did was we then dropped down between two lots, got into the lower topography and ran out and grabbed the sewer out in the road. So, okay. um, so it, it was more of a topographic constraint why it's, so we do have sewer in the road to serve the lots, but then to run out and tie back into the town, we had to run behind the lots. Those, those lots are all generally walkouts. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I also share my concerns about uh, the, the amount of housing within the 100, 150 foot upland. Because um, uh, I know we've, we've actually had developers adjust, uh, you know, the house locations to, for a, a corner of the house was, was within 150 foot and, and they did that. And, and we don't have uh, that much play here for these um so that is a concern of mine and then i'm i'm really kind of surprised on on the little peninsula of water that is is right under the the new uh, basin that's designed that there wouldn't be any kind of vernal pool in there i mean it seems like yeah no doubt yeah below that i see where 
the uh, water line. Uh, the, the, just above that, Bruce. Yeah. He says, see that little. Yeah, little, that, that area. Yeah, yeah, that. It just. I'm surprised not that that we're not seeing a pool in there, but it, um, it, it's not inundated uh, deep enough. It's just no. kind of seasonally flooded, you know, seasonally saturated and shallowly flooded area that will, in a month from now, you won't see it. Okay. I because I drove by it a couple by of times it. with the last you days. Yeah. yeah, and it's it it seems like the wetland area is wider than than what we're seeing, but I don't know. It's hard to tell without a walk so i definitely would like to have a walk on this one um but uh those are the only comments i have right now okay. thanks Ned. And, and just out of curiosity uh bruce did bobby check in or emily check in no i have not okay. seen them but uh check in as it is all yet. right so i'll go ahead and i'll offer some of my comments i agree with the earlier comments about the natural diversity database. I think that needs to be double checked. Um, I do not remember if Tom, you made the comment or James, you made the comment about mild slopes on the property. Can you define what you mean by mild slopes? I think James uh, had commented that, um, that the soils were had a medium uh, erodibility. Yeah, um, it, it was there was a, a specific comment about mild slope. Well, I should have I should have said gentle sloping. It's yeah. not steeply sloping. Okay, but I'll still ask. So gentle sloping. What are you talking about grade wise? Less than ten percent, five percent, less than five percent. Okay. Yeah, and, and we um, we used uh, we worked with the topography here, so many of these lots will actually have walkout conditions to minimize the grading. And if you look at the far left on this site, that's probably the only area of the site that the topography gets up a little steeper. You can see there's a cut slope in the back of those lots, but that's really the only, and, and Jim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the area that's, um, that maybe has some topography as it goes up towards Bristol. But the remaining of this, the parcels are actually quite um, gentle. Um, there's not a lot of topography out there. Right. Okay. Um, I see where the roadway that's shown here pretty much is across from tall timbers. Correct. For the development on the, as you say, to the right, where does yes. that roadway come in on Morea and how yeah, close is it to any Bruce, other roadway? Bruce, the good one might be, uh, Bruce, the, the big overall with the green. I think that was... Um, oh. Yeah, there you go. There you go. You can see, so it's pretty far away from, you can see, uh, yeah, maybe Bruce, if you zoom in. Yeah, here's Cope Farms is right here. Yeah, right, right there. Uh, hold on. You can see where all those white call outs are. Yeah. yeah. I think that's Cope where Farms. the road comes out. And then. Okay, so I guess my question is just knowing what the state sometimes looks for on these, what's the difference in separation? I mean, because my understanding is the state likes 400 feet, but again, I don't know what this is because I couldn't really see the scales. It's, um, uh, I would have to say, I, I think the town standard is, is much less than yeah, that. Yeah, I don't have it in front of me. But, I want to say, but, I want to say it's about 150 yeah. or, or, or 200, Bob. Okay. But on this one, we're probably well over 200. And the, the reason we did it here was we come in high and we drop down to the cul-de-sac. And that works really well with the storm drainage going out to the basin. But, but we can give the commission a little clarity on that, what the subdivision requirements are. But I would have to say um, we're probably two, 200 feet away from the okay. intersection. Okay, no, thank you. Um, I do have some questions about the vernal pool. I, I see where you put, where you showed the 100 foot perimeter, but you didn't show the 750 foot envelope and you didn't identify what percentage of that area would be developed based on the subdivision. So that's something I think that needs to be done. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. And also the way that the detention basin that is proposed to the north of the vernal pool. So I'm assuming that's on the left-hand portion in the olive, olive green area, yes. Yeah. 
There you go. Yeah. So my question though is where you have the detention basin located, what's the distance between the detention basin and the vernal pool? And could that detention basin act as a decoy pool? Well, the green circle there is a hundred feet. So yeah. I would say if I, I did that out, I would say we're probably, if I had to guess, 300 feet to the north of, um, of the vernal, vernal pool. So yeah. from a distance standpoint, that's, uh, those are what I, I'm looking at. I'll let Jim speak to the, uh, the decoy comment. Well, I, uh, I don't necessarily need an answer right now, but again, th these okay. are some questions that I have. Okay. And then whether or not that detention basin, assume you're, you're correct, Tom, it's roughly about 300 feet away. I'm concerned that that could act as a decoy pool, thereby decreasing the efficiency of the existing vernal pool. So there may be some things that need to be done at that basin, it, you know, assuming this goes forward and that gets approved. So it may be something you need to think about in terms of how you can mitigate any potential of a decoy pool being constructed there. Right. Um, at my report, and we'll talk about this at another time, but my report outlines uh, some items as well okay. about, about uh, sort of mitigating for uh, the potential for a decoy. But we can go through that. We can highlight that a little bit more uh, prominently. Yeah, and I mean, also just so you get an idea of kind of where I'm coming from, um, I'm kind of, a, I live right around the corner from here. So I'm aware of some of the issues that surface over in this part of town. And I would probably be inclined to go with a public hearing maybe not so much because of what's being proposed here, but overall in terms of conditions out on Morea Road itself um, and getting some feedback in from some of the neighbors in, in terms of what goes on with Morea Road itself and some of the impacts that they've seen over there over time. Um, I mean, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that there is right now, the way it's designed is there is no direct impact in the wetlands. Everything has been designed to stay outside. You're looking at roughly a 25 foot envelope to try to go from the backyards to the wetlands so you're not disturbing that area. There are a couple of spots that's a little bit closer, but overall you're looking at roughly about a 25 foot buffer. Uh, so uh, again, I'm that's just, accurate. My, my sort of leaning I think would be to go on the safe side and I'm not gonna say that this would necessarily be a significant activity, but I think the project could be significant, significant enough given where it's located in town that I would tend, I think, to go and look for a public hearing on this just to get as much feedback as we can. Um, I mean, some of the things we've seen with some of the other projects in town is we've ended up with much better projects after we get some other impact and the engineers are able to go back and sort of reevaluate and things of that nature. So I'm just letting you know that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I think Robert was saying pretty much the same thing, maybe not in as much detail. Uh, and I do think a, a site walk would also help. But that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, so I don't know if you want to address any of those comments or no, I, I think, uh, you know, some things about the Vernal, the 750 will, and, and the decoy, as you said, Jim, Jim has um, indicated some measures, and I think we've worked on other projects, we've done some measures. So I think we, these are great comments, and I think we got a little work to do. Um, but as we do, we've always done these with, the, with this commission is, it's a process, and I think we do come out on the backside with a better project. So um, we appreciate your comments, and we're, we're ready to work with you as you move forward with this application. Okay, thank you. Mr. So, Chairman, uh, yes. can I ask Bruce a question for just on the public work side? Uh -huh. Does Maria Road, if I remember right, it overtops sometimes in the in the wetland area, doesn't it? Doesn't the road, do we get water over the roadway there? It does during sometimes. We have had problems with the culvert. Uh, there's been some beaver problems blocking that culvert up. And as such, that's why the road has been overtopping, you know, okay. uh, and that's kind of, we've been managing that on a staff uh, level. 
make sure. Yeah, I, 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 I saw some uh, chain link, uh, like, like a padlock to the guardrail right around where Scott, Scott Swamp Brook kind of goes underneath the road. I, I don't know if that was beaver act protection activity or what. That was interesting. Not sure. I look like a DOT or town department of public works stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So that's just my concern that we, I don't, we don't want to be adding more water to that area. If uh, at times we, we get over tapping a Maria road. So uh, that's what we should be shooting for. Yeah. I haven't gotten into the, unfortunately with the timing, I've not got into the drainage report fully yet. Yeah. That's the last, that's the last thing I have to take care of. Thank you. So do any other commission members have any additional comments or questions? Well, hearing none, I think at this point in time, um, I would like to get a motion to accept the application. So if somebody would be willing to do that. This is Mark, so moved. Is there a second? Neil. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to accept the application. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining, okay. Next step is I've heard a number of people talk about a possible site visit. So um, and what's your take on that? Just Rich, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think a site visit is, uh, is appropriate. Okay, thanks, Dave. Yes, definitely. Robert, you already said yes, so I'll do, I'm going to skip you if you don't mind. Neil? Yeah, I agree. Mark? Yes, I agree. And Ned? Yes. And I agree. So Bruce, um, we'll need to set something up for that. Um, I put in there, if you don't mind me, I, I put in there the 9th and the 10th, which would be this weekend. And the only reason I said that is because the weekend after, next weekend after that is Good Friday and Easter. So I assumed everyone would be maybe going out different ways. If we go to a public hearing, maybe we can kick it out a little further. I, I guess I'll leave that to the applicant. If they're, if, if they feel the, the wetlands are properly marked and some properties are out there so we can get an understanding when we do a, uh, a site walk. Um, if it meets. I don't know if it means anything, but I'm going to not be in town either 9th or the 10th. So I won't be able to attend if it happens this weekend. Well, Tom, let me ask you something. Um, are you up against any time frames on this? Uh, Johnny, I don't think we are. Johnny still on? In terms of Meaning uh, pushing this off between two weeks from oh, now or a month in, from now? In terms of when, you know, assuming we go forward with the public hearing, when that would be. I mean, my guess is it's going to be sometime in March. I just don't know if it'd be the first or second meeting in March. May. May. I'm sorry, May. Wishful thinking in March. <laughs> <laughs> Get back up a month. Um, no, I, I think that'll be fine. Okay. Well, I the hope. other Mr. Chairman, the other thing is, I don't, I don't want to do a site walk until we get some of these, uh, you know, property, like uh, uh, the approximate location of the houses and some of that yep. marked out for us. So I don't know if it would be good to do it this weekend. I'm not sure if they could get that no, done. That's why, I mean, and that's why I asked about if there's any particular crunch in timing, because I'm thinking maybe more if we plan on a hearing, assuming we go that way for the second meeting in May. That gives us a little more time to go to the site before the first meeting in May. And it also gives the applicant a little bit of time to go ahead and get some of the information we're looking for, as well as maybe getting like the center line of the road staked out, something along those lines. So at least we know where we're going. That's kind of what I'm thinking off the top of my head right now, but we can confirm that at the next meeting. And Chair, yeah, I we would not be able to get staked out of center line by this weekend. That would not be um, an option. The only um, question to this commission is if you do go to the second 
and, and maybe it's a question for Bruce. When do you have to put notices out to hit the second meeting in, um, in, in May? Well, if we were to if we were to agree tonight, uh, I was talking to Sandy. We can put the we can put the uh, notice in uh, tomorrow, which would give us plenty of time to meet the first meeting in May. You know, what I don't want to what I'm asking is um, is that what well if we're good, if you're moving towards that direction, what we would like to happen is not have not go to the next meeting determine we're gonna have a public hearing at the next meeting, but then find out the notices couldn't go out and now we're pushed out till, till yeah. June. That's all, I, I'm not an expert on, on the noticing. So, um, but I know, cause you guys meet every two weeks. I just wanna know, uh, Bruce, how, you know, can you decide at, can you decide, can the commission decide on, to, you know, at a meeting and you still get notices out to get on the next meeting for public hearing? Or, or do we have to make a decision tonight to make a public hearing at the second meeting? In, in no, I mean, we, we could- standing and recollection of the statutes in terms of when the hearing notice has to go out. There would not be a problem okay. meeting the time frame if we did that at the second meeting of this month, which is the 18th, no, okay. the- Second meeting of May. Okay, so- the, Or a public hearing on the 18th of May. Okay, great. Because uh, it, then it, that timing, if that's then then we're the schedule sounds fine. We we obviously would like to, you know, if we do move, you know, we'd like to not have a trickle into June. So, um, but it sounds like Bruce is telling me is if you made the decision at the meeting, he can get notices out the next day, and you can get on the next agenda for a public hearing. Okay, I mean, I'd like to shoot. I think we shoot for the May fourth agenda. Shannon's got her hand raised. Yeah, I was just going to say, Shannon's got her hand up. <laughs> I'm sorry, and a thousand apologies, because I was going to stay the heck out of this. Um, <laughs> I tried, and I can't help myself. Um, so if you're not doing, we can't do a site walk this week, weekend. The following weekend is Easter. We're not doing a site walk. So that puts us at April uh, 20th for the next meeting. You'll have no real additional information. Um, you would have to make a determination of significance at that next meeting in order to hold a public hearing at that second meeting in May, uh -huh. because it's a three week turnaround for all the notifications. So with us cycling on a two week schedule and we don't have a month with a, a five week session, um, like we just came out of in March, you're gonna be forced to, it'll it'll happen just the way um, Tom was was discussing. It, you you'll get your site walks in. You'll get to your first meeting in May. If you wait and make your determination at that first meeting in May, you're not having your hearing until the first meeting in June. It'll be one month out because we can't do it in a two week cycle. I, I, and I apologize. I, I thought we were talking about making the determination tonight. And the other thing I was going to also put in there is don't forget the clocks have changed, so we don't have to meet on the weekend. We can meet during the week, which I think you guys have done in the past as well. So, for a site walk, you, you're correct. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so we can move that up. That that site walk can move up a little faster, depending on. Uh, yeah, well, when it helps when it doesn't get dark at four thirty. Yes, exactly. So we can work with Tom on when they can get some stuff marked out and maybe meet, pick a, uh, a Wednesday during the week again and just meet out there then. So. Well, listening to what Shannon's saying, it almost sounds like we would need to walk the site then on the 18th or the 19th, so it's after Easter, mm -hmm. that Monday or Tuesday, so we can do what we need to do at that meeting on the 20th, correct? I mean, if I'm understanding you correctly, Shannon. Uh, cor correct, unless the commission... Uh, feels they want to make that determination this evening as Bruce indicated. So unless um, just based on your thoughts and understanding of the, the area um, and that's the direction you want to go, you can make that determination at any uh, now and then you could choose to set the public hearing then for either the first or second meeting in May, that would then be your choice um to allow for whatever time and feedback i mean i i am 
heavily leaning towards a hearing on this. I'm not convinced yet that this is a significant activity, um, but it is a significant development in an area where we've known to have some environmental issues, flooding, things of that nature. So my take would be, I would be more than content to go ahead and have a public hearing scheduled for the seven, I'm sorry, the 18th of May. I think that's the, the meeting then and work forward, but then also you know, try to fill in with a site plan or a site walk. So we have a little bit better understanding as to how some of the lots are laid out, where they are in relationship to the wetlands. Because again, you can look at a flat piece of paper and a map and that's one thing but it's different when you get out on the site. So that's kind of where I'm leaning. And Robert, I think you were talking pretty much the same thing, but maybe not specifically the second meeting in May for a hearing. Yeah, I mean, I, I was opening the dialogue because I think given the number of houses within the 150 foot setback, the very limited separating distance between the actual development and the wetlands themselves and the vernal pool. That was all stacking up for, you know, a potentially significant impact. That, that's why I raised that as part of my initial comments. And then the other thing that we talked about earlier in the evening was making sure that um, the site is reviewed by DEEP for the natural diversity database. That, that could also have a potential significant impact. Here, if if we make the decision tonight, we can have the, the hearing on the fourth, and then that gives you the fourth to have the hearing close, and then that gives you the ability to to push off any kind of uh, approval until the eighteenth. I'm so, not sure you're going to get a deep response from NDDB in that period of time. Okay. I mean, it may even be pushing it to do it on the eighteenth, but at least it gives a, a little more time for that. Because again, I'm not sure who's still standing in that program, if anybody is. I know, Robert, you have a better idea than I do. I'd have to check during the day. Yeah, they're pretty short staff. Maybe yeah. Jim knows. Has Jim, I mean, how long does, Jim, how long does it usually take for them to get back to you? These days? <laughs> 2026 maybe i don't know <laughs> no they're short staffed they're 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 overworked and understaffed um uh, we'll have to we'll have to figure we're, it out we're, we're I know. Seeing, yeah we're seeing a mixed bag sometimes we get it within you know a couple of days sometimes it's it to be honest it's several months so you know it's it's uh, it's, it's going to be associated with scott swamp Brook. yeah yeah so i'm sure there's other developments like the development to the north, right. I'm sure has some information in the files and your records in town. And it's not gonna be any different than us, for us. So what uh, I'm guessing it's probably a turtle. So we'll have to have some protocols up, you know, uh, presented, but I'm guessing, okay. I'm guessing, uh, or if it's a plant, it's within that right, riparian corridor. We're not going anywhere near that anyways. So. But we'll have to see, but you know, NDDB is not like it used to be, so. Uh, their response is varied, unfortunately. So that that's kind of why I'm looking more at the 17th. I mean, and we can deal with it accordingly. Um, but that to me would be, I think, a little bit better for everybody involved. I think that we may have less of a, a wait. And hopefully we have the information at that point in time and not have a hearing set up and nobody has any information. So... So again, my take would be, I, I would feel a little more comfortable with the, the 18th simply because like everybody was saying, they're kind of short staffed at deep. And I think this is an important issue that we need to get some input on. Um, Cause again, I, I, like Jim said, you think it may be turtles, but then again, it could be something else too. So um, that's kind of where I'm going, but I mean, I'll go back through the, the list of commissioners to see, you know, what you kind of think. Ned, we'll start with you at this point in time. Um, based on the history of, you know, the flooding on Maria Road and the number of, you know, full houses that are within 150 foot upland review, uh, I would think that uh, this is a significant use and that we should have a public hearing. 
Okay, when you say significant use, I just need to make sure I understand the terminology that you're using. Okay, well, that it that it would require that we should do a, have a public hearing on this. Okay, so it would have a significant impact or mm -hmm. it, it could be a significant development okay. and therefore may have an impact on the wetlands. Um, I think it's a significant impact on the wit on the wetlands or maybe a significant impact on the wetlands and uh for that and and just the sensitivity of uh the flooding on Murray road I, I think we should have uh a hear public hearing on this okay thank you mark i really don't have an opinion right now because i just think I don't have enough information to make that determination at this time. All right, Neil. Yeah, I agree with Mark. Um, I, I'm not sure it would require a public hearing. I, I hope to know more after a site visit. Okay, Robert. Based on what was presented, I think the development um, has a high likelihood of having a significant impact on the wetlands. So I would favor a public hearing. May 18th would be the target date. Okay, thank you. Dave? What was that? I, I, had I, I, agree, I agree totally with Robert and his reasoning. Okay, thank you. Rich? I'll, I'll agree with Robert too. As will I. So, I mean, we've got five people that are talking about the hearing. So I'm gonna say, why don't we plan on having that set up for the 18th of May? Uh, it'll Mr. Chairman, can I make a motion? Some of the information in, but at the same time, I think I'd like, if we can, I'd like to get the site walk in before the meeting on the 20th. So if we can do something on the 18th or the 19th, which would be after Easter, Um, I think that would give the applicant a chance to at least get some markers down on the site so we have a better understanding as to you know, where the roadway is and, and we can get a better understanding of where the houses are located. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not here that week. So if it's feasible, if we can move it to the week after. Well, the thing that, that happens then is it's, it's after the meeting on the 20th, and then it gets back into what Shannon was saying. Right. We may need the, the hearing on in the beginning of June. Now, if you're making the determination hmm. of significance tonight and, re, and setting that meeting date for May 18th, that's what we need. We need everything yeah. kicks off from when you make the determination uh, that it's a significant project yep. warranting a hearing, um, then that kicks us off for setting the hearing date. So if there's a concurrence on the May 18th, then we're we're fine. And then we can actually just, this this matter doesn't necessarily have to be discussed on April 20th, unless there's uh, additional information to share. And then that would allow us to go out and do the site walk at a later date. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then can I get a motion from somebody saying that this is a significant project and uh, we will have a public hearing for May 18th. So we can at least get some of the dates squared away. I move the application as proposed and presented poses a significant impact to the wetlands and a public hearing should be held. Is there a second? I'll second, Ned. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? No. Mark? Yeah, yeah I oppose. So Neil, too. Neil, too? Okay. Neil and uh, Mark? Neil opposed? and Mark. Yes, Mark. Okay. I don't think it can, may go that direction. I just think at this time, yep. making that determination, I know it's important to make that determination, but I just don't feel I have enough information. No, it's yeah, it's same here. Yeah, same here. It's not a problem. So does that give us some clarity on where we're going on this one then, Shannon and Bruce? I think so. So 
what we can do is um, is plan for if everybody's around, maybe we just keep it and meet the Wednesday after the after the twentieth, or go or or go over uh, the weekend, uh, or go over uh, the weekend. So I'm not sure what everyone's. See, no, we, it would have to be the twenty seventh if it, if that's a day that works for everybody, you know. I like well, the weeknight. Why, why don't you send an email out either, you know, like for the 27th or see if anything can be done on the 30th if we need to do it on the weekend and see what people okay. were able to do. If, if most of us are able to do the 27th, All right. that should be fine by me. That's probably one of the few days I don't have anything scheduled this month, so I might actually be able to do it. Okay. So if you want to follow yep. up with that, you know, sometime yep. this week, I'll follow up with the uh, that together. I'll follow up with the applicant as well and work that out okay. with them. Okay. What time? What time you think in the on that Wednesday you would do it? So like after five, after six, or I think we try if, if five. five yeah. Yeah. Five, yeah. Five o'clock to get there earlier because it's got pretty big. It's a pretty big uh, property. So if everyone can do five o'clock, you know. Yeah. I I don't want to be walking around in the dark either. <laughs> Unless somebody's got a bird feeder, hopefully you don't have to worry about the bears. <laughs> <laughs> They're already in our neighborhood. Okay. The bears so don't bother me. It's the lions and tigers. Those well, don't bother me. We start seeing those. We all better take cover. So, okay. So I think that takes care of this one. Mm -hmm. But I thank sure, you everybody. for your input tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Planners report is next. All right. Plant 17. Planners. Well, what's that? Plant 17. Well, I get yes. Plant 17. Uh, we were out there. We uh, we walked the site. Okay, and uh, we uh, most of the area is still inundated at this point. Hmm. Um, I think I had sent the pictures earlier to you guys, and I for unfortunately forgot to put them in the folder. But um, so a lot of the area is inundated. It is the grass is coming in very good. There is some invasives. They may have to go in there and clean up a little bit. Uh, we talked about uh, just some regrading out there. There's a pile that they want to move. Get that out of the way. All that stuff's out of the out of the uh, upland uh, review, so so we should be adequate there. They're just going to keep going back. The effectiveness of the vernal pool area. I couldn't hear you. What's that? What are we seeing for the effectiveness of the vernal pool area? Well, it is fully inundated. Uh, they did not see anything at the time that we were out there doing our site walk. So, well, but uh, George George said he would keep uh, going out there uh, periodically. Okay. Yeah, because again, that's one of the key things associated with this replanting out there. Mm -hmm. Anything else on it? On uh, plant 17, no. Uh, nothing at this time. Okay, and I think you had a couple other items. Yeah, I had a couple other, other things. One of them was just a reminder about the, about the uh, training. Uh, a couple people have taken the class. I want to thank them for that. So for anyone else that has not taken the training, please uh, feel free to log in and to take care of that. And the other item I had is more or less an FYI. Um, in case anybody's heard anything, the Perry Street development, the old Charles Street, or the old, uh, the old Perry Street Charles House project, uh, that was approved, uh, God, I can't want to say 20... 13 or originally then it's made it's made its uh reapprovals throughout the years there's people looking at purchasing the property and they're out there doing some work as we speak so there has been some exploratory work out there so i know that some of you have not been have not uh, been on when this was approved um but just a little quick map so here's perry street up here and the river's down here so they have some multi-family apartments throughout the project, all going into a um, uh, detention basin over here. And over there, I think as well, my glasses on. <laughs> so, and then, 
So they're just doing some initial work out there, exploratory work, um, test pits, and some and then some uh, borings. So if anybody hears anything, what's going on? That's that's just what they're doing at at this point. So yeah, Bruce, this is a question for you or Shannon. Uh, do we know how the cleanup has progressed on this site? Uh, they have not cleaned up anything. What they've been doing strictly is just monitoring it. All right. And that's part of it as well. They're working with the DEP on this as well. Um, they're thinking of possibly DEP may let them uh, encapsulate the material. And, uh, and that's kind of what they're looking for at this point. I think when it was initially approved, it was hauling a lot of material out of there. But since yeah. then, uh, DEP has changed some of their uh, the regulations and they're looking at possibly letting them encapsulate it underneath any kind of uh, parking areas. So I'm assuming that would be under the buildings primarily and then maybe also under some of the parking lots. But I think it's only under the parking lots if I'm, if I'm uh, correct, not under the buildings, so. Okay. Where, I don't even know where, where, where's Perry Street? Is that near the school, Union School? Yeah, Union School is right here. Okay, all right. And here's Perry Street up in there, so. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question about Plant 17? Absolutely. Um, Bruce, I saw like probably number six picture you did. There was a silk fence and there was material that had over, over, uh, overcame that silt fence and was going down, I assume, into maybe some of the wetlands area. Did you, do you remember seeing that? And uh, I'm trying to remember me. where that picture was, but we talked about resetting some of the silt fence through there. And then they, they said they would take care of that as well. I apologize. Yeah, they would have to do some serious digging or bring some type of uh, machine there. So I didn't know what, they're, what they were gonna propose to do because it was obviously encroachment into that area. Uh, I'm not sure which picture that was. Yeah, I mean, the, the vernal pool area, a lot of the silt fence was inundated under the water. So they were gonna, once well, the, once No, come, th this was, the area where the material is going into didn't look that wet. It looked okay. like it, it wasn't, wasn't water soaked. Um, it was just, the material was going beyond the, the fence and I was just, wondering if they're going to do something about it so it doesn't encroach even further. Yep. I assume oh. there's going to be some type, would it be grasses and stuff like that planted there eventually to yeah, and that, stabilize and, and, it? And you said that was, you said that was a, a photo six, you said? Say again? You said that was a photo six? I think it was photo, photo number six is around That's, there. Right. Yeah, and like I said, I, I know when we walked it, we had pointed out some areas and they were going to have their guy go out there and fix those areas up, so. I'll take a look and see thank you. more on that photo just to confirm. All right, thank you. Anything else, Mark, or was that it? That was it. Okay, thanks. And Bruce, you also wanted to raise the issue, I think, again, about the meetings. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, we have met about um, hybrid meetings today. So we were met with our IT team going over ways to to make this a little, uh, a little easier. And I know I sprung it on you guys two uh, meetings ago, and I know we people have had time to think about it. Uh, the We have been extended to, to next year for for uh, Zoom meetings, but um, I, I know certain uh, uh, commissions are looking to get back uh, in, the, in the person. So we were working on a hybrid method where the commissioners can be at the, uh, Podiums or at the uh, at the uh, um, up on the, uh, the podium, and uh, any of the uh, presenters would be back down in the uh, podium, or 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 if they couldn't attend, then they would be on uh, Zoom, and the screens would allow the developers or the engineers to be up on Zoom. You guys in the in the uh, council chambers. So we've been looking at ways of doing that. So it seems like it's going to work. It looks like TPZ may be the first one to try it out. So again, just opening it up for everybody to see what everybody's feeling is. Um, so we could decide if we're gonna move to a hybrid type um, meeting or if this is gonna be saying a Zoom meeting. As I said, with the hybrids, it does take a lot of effort to get that up and uh, running. So if we're only gonna have one person or maybe two people there, 
it really doesn't make much sense to do that. And I don't mean that in a sarcastic way. It's just that it's a lot of work. Uh, we weren't down there. We've got a lot of uh, producing that we need to do on our behalf before the meeting. So, um, I mean, like I said, if, if, it's a, if it's a weather day, if it snows and no one can make it, then we switch over to Zoom or God forbid something happens and someone can't make one of the meetings and needs to uh, uh, call in, then that's fine. But on a repetitive basis, it'd be nice that if we are gonna go hybrid that we do have at least a, um, a majority of people there, so. I'm almost thinking let planning and zoning be the guinea pigs to see how it works. All right. I mean, does anyone have any initial feelings, you know? I'm flexible. The, the, you know, remote is convenient, but I think live makes sense too, but I'm, I have no strong preference either way. Um, this is Ned. I, I, at the, this time I would prefer zoom just for another couple of months. Um, just for family member and, and, uh, well, you know, I could see myself going back eventually, but I, I, I need a couple more months of Zoom. Understood. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I was serious about if planning and zoning is talking about going to the hybrid, I think I would rather just wait and see how the experience goes to see mm -hmm. if the bugs are worked out of the system. And then if that's the case, then we have a better understanding that, yeah, we can go ahead and do it and it's not going to be a problem. So I, I, I mean, I don't have a problem coming into the meetings, but I just want to make sure that all of the technology is squared away before we sure. you know, step into it. So no, definitely understood. In the next couple of months, we do that and then see how it goes with planning and zoning and okay. regroup and discuss. Sounds like a plan. Okay. So I'll figure that will at least get us into June. So mm -hmm. was that in our planner's report? Uh, Bruce, I, when you said the training, is that the one that uh, some of us recently missed and there, it was recorded? Oh, no, I apologize. That's the uh, that's the wetlands uh, uh, training. That was the um, the wetlands uh, certification. Oh, the deep thing? Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes, the deep. Yeah, I still have to take that. I do want to take it. Uh, okay. And uh, said, if anybody... If anybody has already taken it and has a copy of their certificate, forward it over to me. It'd be great because I have a couple of the new ones that took it. It'd be great to have them in the file just in case if anyone comes knocking. You know? and that's, on, that's on the DEEP website? Yeah, and that's in one of my past uh, – I think I put it yeah. in my planner's report again, didn't I? I mean, the, the, yeah, I, I copied the link in my uh, agenda reveal. So you could just okay. use that for the agenda reveal. Okay. And I believe all three classes are now online. Yes, everything was online. Everyone that took it, they said it took a little longer than what they thought, you know, than, than what they advertised it, but it was very good. They all did very well. So I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so are we ready to move on to the minutes? I'm assuming yes. So can I get a motion to approve the minutes of March 2nd, 2022 Wetland Commission meeting? Is there a motion? So moved by Eisman. Is there a second? That'd be Mark. Mark, you second? That'd be me. Okay. So I have a motion to approve the minutes March 2nd, 2022 Wetlands meeting. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Anybody abstaining? Uh, I will abstain, Statchen. Okay. So looks like it's about 8.30. So we'll call a close to the Wetlands Commission meeting and open the Conservation Commission agenda, um, you know who's here. So other business land acquisition committee report. Um, Ned, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a meeting, I think on the 14th of this month. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's a meeting on the 14th. There wasn't one last month. So I think that's probably about it there. Yeah, they're, I, if you look on the town website, they're going to quarterly meetings. Right. So, and there's one on the 14th this, this month. Yeah, it's the second Thursday of the month, correct? Yes. Yes. Planners report. Sorry, I don't have any this time. Okay. So last thing on the agenda is the minutes. So can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the March 2nd, 2022 Conservation Commission meeting? So moved by Eisner. Is there a second? Second by Mark. Second by okay. Mark. So I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 2nd, 2022 Conservation Commission meeting. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Abstain. Okay. Ed. So we will call this meeting complete and adjourn.